Okay, well, I've put the, the link in the chat to other Peace Week sessions, but now it's time to start this Peace Week session. I'm Susan Allen. I'm faculty here at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. And very pleased to, to welcome all of you and particularly our alumna, Dr. Julie Mindy, uh, to this Peace Week session. Uh, Peace Week is focusing this year on Rethinking Peace 2022 and Beyond. And uh, Dr. Julie Mindy it brings us a fabulous topic, geospatially mapping the conflict. And this is giving us a way for those of us who don't think about maps as much, Julie gives us a way to, to realize the relevance of mapping um, to understanding conflict analysis and conflict resolution. Julie, uh, it's always a pleasure to welcome back alumni. Um, and particularly uh, wonderful that you've agreed to present today. Julie is serving as a visiting scholar at the Center for Peacemaking Practice here at the Carter School. She's leading the project Geography Mapping and Peacemaking. She recently finished a postdoc position uh, on environmental collaboration and conflict resolution that was co-sponsored by the Udall Center for Studies and Public Policy at the University of Arizona and the National Center for Environmental Conflict Resolution. Julie received her PhD in conflict analysis and resolution from George Mason University's Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. She also received an MS in geographic and cartographic sciences from George Mason University and an MA in Russian language and literature from the University of Iowa. She recently retired from 30 plus years as a National Guard Reserve Intelligence Officer with four deployments. Uh, so with that introduction, Julie, let me welcome you again and turn the session over to you and, and Amber Williams will also be assisting with this session. Um, thank you, Amber, and thank you, Julie, over to you. Hey, thank you so much uh, for that uh, lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. I'm going to um, share my screen here. So. My um, session addresses the role of maps in conflict resolution efforts, as, as Susan alluded to. As conflict resolution uh, practitioners, I strongly feel we should pay closer attention to maps and mapping in our work. Practitioners are trained to strive to create an environment of parity amongst the stakeholders. We attempt to level the playing field so that stakeholders are not disadvantaged while they attempt to lobby for their interests. Both the literature and my own work, my own research, indicate that ensuring an even playing field among stakeholders regarding maps and mapping is an important consideration for conflict resolution as well. And so as we go through this, I just wanna say, um, I'm sticking to my script just to keep me on track because otherwise, you know, I just love talking about everything to do with this type of stuff and I'll go off and then before we know it, it'll be over. That said, please feel free to jump in and if you wanna unmute yourself, make a comment or a question or whatever like that. And then Amber is gonna be monitoring the chat for me um, part mostly because I'm blind as a bat and I can't read that far away from my screen. So um, what we've got right now is, um, so the agenda, you know, I'm going to talk, like I said, about some of my work in this area um, and some considerations in case you would like to um, consider maps and mapping more on your work. We're going to go through a couple fun, I think they're fun anyway, scenarios. Um, we're going to break out into little groups and, and do a couple of scenarios, kind of analyze the use of maps um, in, in these scenarios, and um, a couple more points on how to incorporate this stuff, and then we'll conclude. Hopefully, there'll be a little bit of time left over in case you have any questions. But So maps help us reach goals. Map help us reach places. We help us manage resources, but whose places, whose goals, whose resources? And so, you know, when we're mapping, we need to keep these things in mind. And so, you know, my spiel is maps tell stories. They hold narratives, values, priorities, assumptions. What's, what story might this be uh, telling. And uh, Susan, if you can monitor the chat for me, that would be helpful. Okay. So folks, you know, if you want to jump in um, and say something, feel free, or if you want to type it in the chat. But you see, this map was produced by the Belarusian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1994. So if you go back in history and think about what was going on around that time, you know, shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union. But look over here where Belarus is. This is supposed to be the, the central, well, at least conceptually, you know, topic-wise, uh, the central point, point of the map is Belarus, Belarus, 
if you look at the, the framing of this map, you see what it has basically very um, focused outward in a specific direction. So this one, this is a kind of a, a fun map. It's a cartoon, I know, but conceptually, I think this is, this is a neat map to look at. So what story might this map be telling? Who might it represent? But what I'd really be interested in hearing from you is who might this map be marginalizing, if anyone? I mean, it's so cute. How could it marginalize anyone, right? Bicyclists, it's got cars and stuff, but no bicycles. Preci yes, precisely, you guys nailed it. Oh, and you've got in the chat, someone else typed focused on drivers. Yeah, exactly. So, oh, seems to be plagued by tech issues, of course, that's one of the downsides to this sort of thing. When in, at this point, what I'd like to do is, like I said I, before, I'd like to discuss my, my research with you because I'm, I'm thinking this will really give some good solid examples of, of what I really mean when I, I say that we ought to be focusing more on maps and mapping in conflict resolution. So my dissertation project, um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to better understand how stakeholders in a conflict situation, particularly a conflict resolution effort, as I call it, how they felt about the maps that were being used for that effort. Um, and this perception of this perception of legitimacy, that concept helped me to better see connections between various aspects like power relations, social dynamics, and how they relate to maps and mapping. And, and by the way, I often use the term maps mapping instead of just maps, um, because I want to ensure that the process of making maps is included, not just the product, because I think that's, and I found that to be really important. So Julie, so, the polls are ready if you wish Amber to do the polls now. Um, thank you. You know, if we can get to it at the end um, sure. or a little bit later, I'm just concerned I'm going to run out of time, but, but thank you. So this was my methodology. Uh, like I said, I was looking at legitimacy and I conceptualized three types of legitimacy as being important. Stakeholder, information, and representation. So who was considered legitimate to map? What was considered legitimate to map? and you know, the legitimacy of the map product itself. So I had two case studies. And so the first case study focused on how to maintain both the thriving poultry industry, so chickens, and healthy water quality on Delmarva Peninsula in the Eastern United States. The Delmarva Land and Litter Challenge, the DLLC, was a group that was brought together in 2016 to try to determine a mutually acceptable way forward in peninsula. And that was supposed to determine the balance between too much and too little of these nutrients um, in order to maintain both successful agriculture and healthy waterways. So consensus among the stakeholders was needed um, and, and they had significant problems with that and it was tied to this mapped product. So the agricultural community and the environmental community disagreed first of all on like what scale to use. So the agriculturalists insisted on doing like a broad scale, macro scale type study. They said, you know, that they needed to get this project done for expediency's sake. They needed to just to do it at the macro level. Micro level studies could be done later if there was interest and money to do that. But the environmentalists insisted that a micro scale was needed in order to have a more precise understanding of ecological processes and dynamics. Then there was also strong disagreement over the modeling assumptions to be used for this mapped mass balance assessment. Again, the agriculturalists, um, they, they con well, they conducted the assessment, but they used the assumptions that were favorable from the agricultural point of view. Um, and some of the data was only available to them based on their government status. Um, the assessment was approved, of course, by the agricultural community, but not the environmentalists. And when a senior scientist from the environmental side asked for the supporting data to run uh, a mapped model independently. That request was denied and they were told they had, you know, they were asked to endorse this assessment based on the so-called professional judgment of the departments of agriculture. The environmental camp refused to sign it off on it and the project came to a halt. Um, so the agricultural stakeholders, particularly, particularly the uh, departments of agriculture were accused of withholding data, marginalizing the environmentalists, and abuse of authority. 
and then in turn, the environmental stakeholders were blamed for waiting until the last minute to disclose a fundamental disagreement, thereby causing a significant setback in the project. Now later on, but after I was done with the, my part of the study, the subcommittee agreed to reach out to a third party, the Salisbury University GIS office, to research and develop a dashboard for them. Now up on my screen, this is case study two. Um, so this one focused on oysters. And this was in Lynn Haven River, Virginia Beach, so where there's a, a big growth in oyster cultivation. And it sparked a conflict between landowners and watermen. That's watermen is an old-fashioned term for, for oyster cultivators. So now this conflict revolves around who owns the water, who has the rights to use the water, and for what. Many homeowners along the shore, the shores of the river and tributaries believe that their ownership extends to the water. When it doesn't, it's actually public water. And in recent decades, property values have, ris ri have, have risen, excuse me, dramatically, further flaming tensions due to perceptions of property owners' sense of entitlement. So the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, the VMRC, um, they have an engineering surveying department and they're responsible for managing these public waters and, and um, selling oyster leases. That's how you can cultivate oysters there is through buying these oyster leases. So with the rise in tensions, this poor uh, beleaguered in, um, engineering surveying department became the unwitting epicenter of the oyster conflict. They fielded complaints, mediated disputes, conducted public meetings and problem solving sessions and led an oyster conflict working group that was convened in 2016 to try to, to resolve the conflict or at least mitigate it. As part of public outreach, the, uh, I'll call it the ES department, published online a simplified version of the oyster lease GIS that they used to manage the oyster leases. Uh, and GIS, if I hadn't said this already, geographic information systems, I think that's a commonly known term, but just in case. So computerized mapping with backup databases, you can do analysis, create new maps online and so forth. So this public version GIS sparked significant increase in citizen engagement over oyster plot permitting, um, both with the ES department and each other. So I found in this case study that the framing of a map can influence stakeholders' framing of a conflict. The online oyster lease GIS focused on surprise, surprise oyster leases. And this is all well and good when using the GIS for its original purpose, i.e. an oyster lease management tool. However, as citizens became more engaged, the GIS um, was used for other purposes, most notably dispute resolution. Only seeing oyster lease information compelled users to visualize the environment as a landscape of oyster leases. And this sort of binary oyster lease, no oyster lease framing seemed to encourage homeowners to push back against oyster leases and oyster cultivation in general, instead of trying to look for possible solutions to their specific cases. However, there appeared to develop some realization that including other information might be useful. And significantly, and to, in my opinion, to, to their credit, the ES department worked with citizens to include their own information in the maps that were used, particularly at public meetings and in mediated engagements between stakeholders. Interviews indicated that because the department allowed stakeholders to present their own information, such as photos, sketches, you know, their own maps, and even incorporated these data where possible into the government maps, there was a greater sense of inclusion among stakeholders that improved trust and facilitated engagement and conflict resolution. So key lessons from this were one, the social side of maps, mapping is significant and needs to be considered. Two, inclusion or exclusion in maps and mapping can have a significant impact on a conflict resolution process. In the Delmarva poultry case study, perceived marginalization of some stakeholders led to a breakdown in the conflict resolution process. On the other hand, in the Lynn Haven oyster case study, perceived inclusion contributed to greater levels of social engagement and conflict resolution activities. Thus, I determined that legitimacy of stakeholder, i.e. who maps, who's considered legitimate to map, proved the most significant form of legitimacy. Uh, the third lesson was it's important to critically consider how maps are being presented and used to avoid unhelpful, counterproductive, or even damaging framing that might negatively affect a conflict resolution effort. 
And then lastly, there's also the increased potential for the transformation of relations and ability to affect change. This equates to the ability to have discussion, debate, share information, and build trust. As one of my interview interviewees commented, it doesn't go well when you just give people a map. You should have a discussion. So that was my, let me get this stuff here. Yep, okay, I was looking at the chat real quick. So that was my dissertation work. I went on to do um, a postdoc last year, and it was co-sponsored by the Udall Center for Studies in Public Policy at the University of Arizona and the National Center for Environmental Conflict Resolution. This research project generally was to, and this was a quote from the project, examine the role of engagement and inclusivity within environmental collaboration and conflict resolution processes that involve, impact, or inform federal agencies and issues. So the specific project we selected investigated the use of a geospatial online participatory tool at the US Army Corps of Engineers. So first then, what's a geospatial online participatory tool? So a GeoOPT, geo as we're calling it, is an online app used to solicit input using a map interface. So think crowdsourcing, think, you know, pull out your phone and, you know, plug in a, where a pothole is on a local government website. These tools are still somewhat new, but are becoming increasingly popular as tools for public participation and governance. Some commonly perceived positives include the ability to reach more and more diverse participants, data management, and geospatial specificity of shared information. So here's like one example, this homeless activity manager, people can, and this is being used across the country in, in various um, major urban areas to document homeless activities so can, the governments can better support the homeless communities. Another one, oops, eyewitness um, is used to document war crimes. And there's, I found one that was um, being used to support um, Uk Ukrainian war crimes reporting. So my project, again, you know, I'm looking at one of these tools called Crowdsource Reporter um, by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers because I had to look at a federal agency. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, if you don't know, is a leading national water agency that's geographically structured, broken out by division and district headquarters, determined by watershed boundaries. Um, the, the core, I'll call it, began using Crowdsource Reporter in 2018 to gather public information for certain projects, such as for public comment periods for environmental impact statements and master plan revisions. If you've heard of NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, there's certain um, uh, laws that, well, which is a law that um, me means that certain government agencies have to get public input on projects that might have an environmental impact. So from the academic perspective, the project falls under a broader research agenda that intends to better understand these tools in environmental governance. So I looked at three sets of case studies. So one was the location of a new confined disposal facility in Chicago district three master plans for reservoirs in Pittsburgh district and an environmental impact statement for Portland district's Willamette Valley system. I got to travel around too. That was, that was pretty neat to, to see these places. So naturally, one of the things I did in the study was I studied the tools themselves and I observed how these tools can impact how users understand or interpret what they see on the screen. Um, so for example, the design of the interface, the language that was used, what instructions are provided, the type of labeling, other map features, and so forth. I also noticed that users' pre-existing points of view could also impact how they interpret the tool. And this gets to larger questions, such as how do we communicate through maps? What are the narratives that are embedded, the assumptions, values, priorities, things that I discussed earlier. This, so this research kind of continues on from other things that I've I've done and um, reinforces it. So here's, a, here's a, a, an example for you. Um, this case study looked at the course use of Crowdsource Reporter as part of public scoping period for the location of a new confined disposal facility in 2018. Chica the course Chicago district has a mission to dredge waterways in and around Chicago 
due to legacy toxicity in the soil, and it's unrelated to the core, they didn't cause it, but they're stuck dealing with it, dredgings must be confined um, in a confined disposal facility. In 2018, a new facility was needed because the old one was almost full. Um, this siting project was, was extremely controversial. The Corps had picked out nine possible options. They were centered on a place called 10th Ward, which is a Southeast Chicago neighborhood. Uh, it already had the current um, confined disposal facility. They were also already designated an environmental, environmental justice community. If you don't know what an, an environmental justice community is, it's composed predominantly of persons of color and or a substantial proportion of persons below the poverty line that is subjected to a disproportionate burden of environmental hazards. So the CrowdSource Reporter app was designed with the nine proposed sites identified on the screen. And you can kind of see that in the upper right. Um, the, the public was asked to provide comments about the sites to help us to decide where to put the CDF. Uh, you can see the red call out box. We hope you will share your knowledge about these sites and so that we can incorporate that into our analysis. We're interested to hear from you about the opportunities and challenges that these sites represent. By the end of the public comment period, the Corps had received 332 comments, which is a fair number. However, a large percentage of the comments were copy pasted across all of the given categories. More significantly, most of them didn't offer the type of information about the sites that the Corps wanted. Instead, the majority of the comments expressed quite negative views about locating any facility in 10th Ward at all. And I wanted to show you what this looks like. Okay, um, Susan, we're still we're still on, right? I, I kind of hear a little bit of, of background, so I'm no, I hear, I hear you. I'm not <laughs> hearing anyone else. I'm hearing you. Okay, that's cool. Um, that was my biggest concern, is I'm like talking to my water bottle. Um, so this is a snapshot of the comments from this tool, and so I'd ask you please take a moment. And look, these, these are the comments from these folks that live there when they were asked to provide input on these nine sites. Stay out of the 10th ward. Stay out, keep the dredgings out. Hear us when we say no, enough already. Um, yeah, not going to allow you, you say, you say says Army Corps to dump more toxic filth. Those red boxes are mine, by the way. Um, but yeah, you can see just, um, you know, I wanted you to see this. And this isn't me cherry picking little comments. This is a, an honest, just straight snapshot of a portion of this database. So all these, so many of these comments were exactly like this. Um, so I think it also shows the perspectives of these participants. It seems clear that they're, they've got quite strong views before even using the tool. So negative impressions of the project, even negative impressions of the core itself. So, you know, again, back to thinking about the map. So I argue these pre-existing points of view appear to have impacted at least some people's interpretation of the tool. So this was the first time, by the way, that the Corps had used CrowdSource Reporter. In addition to the nine proposed facility sites, the project team wanted to include um, a category for other in case people wanted to put in additional input, but there wasn't technically a good way to design that feature at the time. So the team put their other category on this blue dot here in this waterway. You see that blue dot? I don't think you can see my cursor, but you see the blue dot in the middle of the waterway. Um, and so, but there's a text um, box that explains it in the upper right. Please use this location to submit comments if you believe there are additional potential sites along the Calumet River that we should consider. Okay, it looks a little awkward, right? But unfor and, and unfortunately, this not ill-intended but arguably clumsy um, effort was not well understood. Between there not being much labeling, particularly addresses to identify the nine proposed sites, and being upset about being limited to the nine sites to begin with, all in their neighborhood, at best people were confused. At worst, some felt offended, as one said, so the core is telling me what they think of my opinion, dump it in the river. So I would submit that there might not have been such an intense sense of insult in a less controversial, less emotion-laden case. And some more insight comes from a community representative who was totally against using this app at all because they felt it was kind of a trap to force the community to endorse a facility, a confined disposal facility in their neighborhood. That was an indicator to me of a low level of trust. 
So these, these were some really good quotes. It was a choice not to use the app because the app that the US Army Corps of Engineers is like basically forcing you to pick your poison. So in other words, instead of asking where we wanted it or even if we wanted it, just said pick, pick your poison, pick. And then they, they went on to say, they come in and go, here's our proposal, react. And you can only react within these confines, right? You can only pick from these nine sites. We've already done the analysis. We're already partial to some of these, but we're gonna allow you to pick. But you're not really giving the community a choice because it's your choice, your limited choice that you're asking us to. Like I said, we really felt like you're asking us to pick our poison and it shouldn't be that way. So you've already limited the choice. You're not actually asking. And then lastly, they went, they went on to say, you need to have the community conversation first and then do the mapping app. People really resent being pigeonholed into making the decision when it's not even the right conversation. So I thought that gave me a lot of really good insight. So uh, interestingly, across all the cases, all these sets of cases, I commonly heard from the Army Corps um, that Crowdsource Reporter, this, this GeoOBT, this app, was easy to set up and run. However, as I learned more about what might be required for a crowdsource reporter to be truly successful, I started to see that the basic tool setup and execution are just the tip of the iceberg. There's much more complexity than one might think, especially when you delve into social dynamics and power relations and how those can play out in communications via these tools. So the hard work lies in getting the processes right and the social considerations and communications and relationships. So that was a fascinating study because I went into this study thinking, wow, you know, such a simple app, you know, what, what can go wrong, right? Well, I found out, <laughs> found out quite a bit what can go wrong. I'm just going to check the chat real quick. Okay, good. Yeah, so, well, you had a nice message saying that they could hear you and it's great. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So, so switching bits, so those were my two big blocks of, of research. And I have to say, I really love this, this type of research and I think it's important. So um, I'm gonna say this at the end, but I'd like to say it now too. If anyone's interested in, in getting help or, or doing research or getting help with their practice, um, I, I would love to take part in that. Um, so between the dissertation and the postdoc, I found that the ability to interact with the map data and to interact with each other over the map data, like these little kids over this map, that is important as a means to ena for enabling stakeholders, for allowing them more universal control over conflict resolution related information. However, in order for such valuable en engagement to occur, three things have to happen. First, the stakeholders have to be allowed and empowered to interact in a geospatial environment. Second, they have to see it as important to do so. And third, stakeholders must be adequately map literate to represent themselves and lobby for their interests. So as conflict resolutionists, I've, I've developed a little kind of a conceptual walkthrough of a general process you know, to use in a conflict resolution effort you know, in evaluating the maps and mapping situations. So important questions include, who makes the maps? Who controls the data? How are the maps made? What do they mean? Whose narratives do they represent? Discussions with map makers themselves and with stakeholders are important for answering these questions and also for understanding how the stakeholders understand the maps, if their voices and stories are included in the maps, and if the maps will appropriately support the conflict resolution effort. Then the practitioner monitors the maps and mapping that are going on during the conflict resolution effort, asking questions such as, do particular stakeholders dominate the maps? Are stakeholders expressing frustration with each other regarding the maps and mapping? Are stakeholders walking away due to issues concerning the maps? Or are stakeholders engaging openly and constructively over the maps with all parties able to lobby for themselves appropriately? So what I've got now is a scenario. We, we're, we're going to um, hopefully do both scenarios, but here's the first one. What we will do is I'll read through the scenario. The second one doesn't have as much text. Sorry about all the text on this one, but we'll go through this and we're gonna go into breakout rooms and where you can discuss what you think about the maps and mapping being used and come back and each group can, can comment. So this, this scenario, scenario number one, the neighborhood community is concerned about the intersection of A and First Street. They feel the intersection is dangerous, especially for children crossing the street daily, walking to and from school. Additionally, being a lower income neighborhood, there are higher than average pedestrians 
Moreover, there is also a large elderly population, many of whom are mobility, seeing, and or hearing challenged. A Street is heavily used by drivers cutting through to get downtown to or from work. Speeding as well as running the stop sign are common occurrences. The neighborhood group has produced a petition signed by over 60% of the, of the neighborhood asking the local government to install a stop light. And there's already a stop sign, but they want to stop light at the intersection. The local government has agreed to meet with the community group and has asked you to observe the meeting. At the meeting, the government rep brings handouts with various data and projects, uh, or excuse me, and projects a map up onto the screen. The map is a city scale zoning planning map with features such as roads, structures, some facilities. The government rep helps the neighborhood community leaders find their neighborhood on the map, which is not very well labeled. It's awful, also difficult to see details from where they're seated in the room. Residents plead their case and the request for the stoplight, but avoid using the map. The government rep briefing from the map places a cursor on the intersection of A and First Streets, which completely covers the intersection due to the scale and reviews the notes that address traffic patterns, accident locations, and the budget. He cautions that the town does not currently have much money budgeted for such items and Given the current data, a new stoplight is not, unfortunately, a priority item. He recommends putting up signs around the neighborhood, urging drivers to slow down. The meeting falls apart when one community leader walks out in tears. The others leave in frustration. Regarding the maps, what impact, if any, did the maps seem to have, seem to have on the, me the meeting and the dialogue? Do you have any recommendations for how the map could be improved so that it might enable particularly the neighborhood group to tell its story and to lobby for its interests more effectively. So that's the scenario. And so now, Amber, I'm hopefully I won't like throw everything out of, out of whack again, um, Zoom wise. If we would like to be able to break into, let's say four groups, if we're able to. Sure. You, awesome. How about if we start with group one, if, if a representative from group one could speak for a, a minute or, or so about what, what you came up with. Um, let me see, I'll put my camera on if you all can see me. So something that we covered in my group was essentially kind of two things, right? So one being how overall the display of the map simply derailed a lot of the concerns that the individuals within that space were bringing up and communicating just due to some like, um, non-specific, like the map only brought up situations that could discourage what they wanted as opposed to it being current and up to date and allowing to reinforce a lot of their opinions and a lot of their testimonial wants and desires for the space. In addition to that, we talked about how a lot of the, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought, <laughs> trying to like grab it right back so I can remember my point. But um, all in all, we felt as if bringing up more uh, factual data, such as some of the police reports, uh, tickets, speeding, all of those different like concrete um, data-driven materials and references could have better supported their claims into getting that stoplight put there. And then also simply having them um, bring up their own map or like drawing up their own map or even uh, having another representative be in the space to see would this map be beneficial to bring into as evidence for this, you know, current issue. So those are kind of some of the things that we talked about. And then um, I know me and, <laughs> and uh, Sarah, we talked about something coming up in her situation, um, like where she was going to uh, like a dog park and having like a, a actual like, excuse me, a dog run like a playground and then also like something else in one space and she brought up a really good point about how sometimes people have predetermined ideas of what they want for a space already to kind of drive a mindset and that could just be another method of marketing something that's lower cost or maintenance over time and just being aware of the influences that a map already pre drawn up could have on the opinions of the individuals and what they want so yeah that's awesome. Awesome input. Thank you so much, Diane. Any other brave folks from groups one, two, or four? Feel free to unmute and discuss. Um, I, 
I would just say uh, to push that, uh, I think her name was Kristen in group one made a comment about mental models. I thought that was very uh, um, valuable. So I just wanted to encourage her to, to speak up. Kristen, you're being called out. You're being voluntold. And I guess uh, if, if uh, otherwise I can try to uh, say, repeat her point was that uh, just, it was a suggestion about how um, a good starting point would have been to, um, to do some mental modeling of how the community see or map out um, their own uh, neighborhood, um, kind of get them to describe the, uh, the important places that, um, uh, that they whatever frequent or, or the, the spaces that are important to them. And uh, <laughs> thanks, Kristen. Yeah, sorry, I had to close, I had to close my office door. Um, no, it does go. I think you're explaining it fine if you want to, if you want me to. Mm, yeah, it was just, uh, this is uh, something that I just thought was a really interesting way to even especially if you're kind of if you're you've got one map and you're kind of trying to introduce it and maybe it's not the best map for the case, then I thought that uh, something like this where you can elicit elicit the uh, the kind of yeah the mental maps that the people in the room have and then you could kind of add them in identify those locations on this map and and get some connection to the people. I just um, thought that was worth mentioning. You, you know, actually, Eric, that is like, um, I ha let me show you this. Um, see this crime fears map? This is something um, of the few things I thought that I could bring. Um, this one I thought kind of resonated most with how I felt about this, which is spot on with what you're talking about. Like you could just take a, a map that you pulled off from somebody's government site and you see where these people, they put in things like, hey, somebody could hide in these bushes or people don't feel safe along this stretch of whatever, this road. Um, you know, and you could even just do that like in PowerPoint, or you could take sticky notes or something like that and give this picture, like you're saying, of people's concerns, their values, their interests, whatever. And you don't have to know how to map to do that. You, 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 but you do need to be able to gather, like you said, you know, people's thoughts and, and incorporate that in so their voices are heard. Does that sound like something similar to what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, uh, I think it's interesting and something that uh, I can really see using in the future. Cool. Um, well, I think the rest of you folks are are a little bit off the hook because um, I want to make sure we get to the second scenario and maybe also too if this stuff doesn't feel quite natural to you, then maybe another scenario will will kind of help um, move along the, the 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 thoughts about it. So this is scenario number two. So. Informal water talks between representatives of two conflict communities have finally begun a few years after the government of one community, B land, broke away and declared independence from the other, A land. You've been invited to support a team facilitating the talks. However, the talks immediately stall when A land pulls out the official, gover the official government maps. There's a disagreement over where the border is, what type of border it is, is it regional or is it international? The language, the script that are used for the labeling, what things are called, and related issues. Some participants from both sides have taken to sketching their own little maps to at least try to do some problem solving. However, these sketches are imprecise, like you see off to the right, thus making it difficult to pull together tangible plans and action items. What, if anything, can be done? So let you look at that. Well, Amber, if you could pull up for uh, four groups, they can either be the same or different, whichever, whichever you find easier. Awesome, all right. Can I have a group representative? What do you folks think about this scenario? Any thoughts, for what could be done with the mapping situation? That's Avery in chat. Avery says, hi, I'm sorry my mic isn't working, but I feel like one of the major issues was the lack of clear communication between the groups in both dialogue and maps. 
The maps were confusing because they're handmade quality and it seemed like the groups had different perspectives on how to proceed, which made actual change difficult. I think they should establish a more uniform way of creating the maps. And I think Olivia, I was speaking with in my group. Olivia, did you, you were gonna report out from our group? Yeah. Um, so we talked about how um, that they could either come together and create a, mate, um, a map um, that, you know, both includes um, that different levels. And then we also discussed, um, like, I forgot like the word, but um, using like an actual image of the land and doesn't include sort of the political aspects of this situation to show like what's really there and how to work with that. That's fantastic. Um, in fact, I've got some stuff to show on a, a, a next slide, but does anybody that, that pertains to that, um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to, to add, any other ideas? I could speak for my group as well. Um, just to hop in here, but something that we spoke about in um, our group was, or an idea that I had in particular was essentially having them come up with some of the data that they have regarding their own of their property. So my interpreted approach in like attacking this issue because there's so many different moving parts because the conversation stalled, essentially just getting conversations to start up again. So whether that be disputing information that they don't agree with, whether that is um, coming to some type of compromise over rights, you know, having some type of conversation or some type of dispute allowing for them for two sides to come back together go and going from there would potentially be the best option for that because you wouldn't have a map to dictate where things were but you have actual data like hey i own this these are all the people that also own this land and these spaces so going from there you can figure that out but, but like overall just getting conversation started up again would probably be the best option. So, Thank you very much. Um, anybody else have any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll speak actually. Um, so I think one of the big things our group was talking about was uh, one of the, the big issues that we initially saw was the uh, imprecise sketches, but we talked about how those could be like an important stepping stone or beginning point for the group to identify maybe what really matters to them and use that to like take the next step forward um, with like, let's say a, an actual printout of a precise map to mark up as a group and use that as like the driving point for the conversation to go through in an official precise drawing, actually sit there with a marker or pen or something and draw on it and discuss through what each group is kind of identifying as disputes or areas that they can look to shape the border. Uh, when it came to like the, the language and the script used for the labeling, another thing our group discussed was having either having both groups just like acknowledge that, you know, they're, they're not going to come to an agreement and come up with like a, a different maybe like naming or labeling system that they both can agree upon that doesn't really come from like the roots of both of their like cultures within the land or to possibly have like a a park or like some sort of um something in the center like a center point that they will use as that bridging between the two lands or potentially using the naming system of having what a land calls it and b land call it and then put that into like one official kind of like name where it lists both of them, um, some of the things that just our group discussed. So yeah, that, that's perfect, thank you. Um, so I wanna actually address that a little bit here. Like um, one of you was talking about like kind of like suppressing the concept in the drawing of the border so that it's not quite so obvious. So like you see it here, like here's where it's very clear and very orange, isn't it? That this is the, the boundary that is in dispute. You can still maybe have it if you just made it into a, a thinner one, but then have the, what's important, what we're talking about is water. 
so have the hydrology on top and so it's more obvious and so it's less controversial and still doesn't fix the problem of there being this boundary this border but it, it makes it a, you know just the perspective makes it a look, look a little bit different and might be appealing to some groups and i think one of you mentioned you know focusing on the places the individual like the local level ownership of places and such so then um one way to do a lot of this stuff is through a GIS, like a computerized mapping. If you're talking about um, a, developing a, a like a bridging narrative, you could do this if you could incorporate all the data into layers into a GIS, a computerized GIS. You could put everything here, your imagery. So if you only wanna look at the imagery, like the satellite imagery, if you wanna even have different languages, if one side says, look, I don't mind if we work off of you know, a map using, you know, the other side's language, but I cannot present it in any official capacity because I need to represent my, my country. And then you can do that. You can just click on the layers that show their language or their boundaries or whatever. So, you know, you can change it and you can show what data you want to show. As long as you've incorporated it into this GIS, you can have it. If you, if you want to even use, you know, the, the napkins written, you know, the maps written up on napkins and, it, you know, import that in and somehow geo-reference it. I mean, you can do all sorts of stuff with this, but this would help um, the sides maybe co-develop um, a map that they that they can live with and work off of. So, um, so I really appreciate your comments and it, it seems to uh, really kind of reinforce that it's about maps are so much about social considerations about working, you know, together and, and understanding what they mean, you know, in a, in a conflict resolution effort. So then, whoops, I'm going to leave my last thing here. Um, and we're down to just a few minutes before we do need to end. Yes, I know. So this is really the last substantive slide. So, you know, what, what can you do if you want to move forward with maps? Um, you give just a couple, three main options. You learn how to make your own maps. If you're a George Mason student or faculty or something, you can get an ArcGIS license. Um, there's free GIS available, um, but I'll tell you, these things take time to learn. So, you know, you've really got to think that maps are important for your work and that you need to be the one doing it yourself to, to really take those on. There's other things, you use Google Earth. Felt.com, you can make really simple maps, story maps. Um, you could contact, Jack Teason at George Mason. He's a geospatial resources librarian. He is awesome, really awesome person. And he provides a lot of great resources. There's organizations out there like GIS Corps. They will support communities um, that need to be represented, that need their voices heard on maps. And they will assign um, folks to um, go out and work with them and help them developing, develop the mapping they need to, so that they can lobby for their interests. And then lastly, engage with me. As Susan said, I'm a visiting scholar under this program, or heading this program, I should say, under the CPP, Geography, Mapping, and Peacemaking. So if you want any um, assistance in you know, finding resources um, and stuff like that, please feel free to, to reach out to me. And I'm also available if anyone wants to have um, any additional engagement, like seminars, or you know, want me to go to class, talk about this, or something like that. And this is my contact information. And um, yeah, I don't think we have any time for questions, unfortunately, but I'll stay on the line in case anybody um, wants to talk after, after this is over. Well, thank you so much, Julie. Really, really informative. And you got us into small groups working on two really interesting scenarios. And um, I know every time after I've talked with you, Julie, I can't look at anything without seeing maps and mapping potential. It's just like, it's we we do so much in life that that's that's map related without even being aware of it and you really help us be aware and then once we have that awareness we can make more constructive choices about how to use maps productively um so you're really doing some some useful work here uh i'll, I'll close the session formally with that and um well, right on time right as my timer had set <laughs> set to go off um and thank you all for coming uh take care Bye-bye and, and check out other Peace Week, other Peace Week uh, events. <laughs>